You're listening to World Class from the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. We bring expertise on international affairs from Stanford's campus straight to you. I'm Michael McFall, the host of World Class and director of the Freeman Spogli Institute. My guest today is Professor Francis Fukuyama. He's the director of both the Ford Dorsey Masters in International Policy program and the Center on Democracy, Development, and Rule of Law here at FSI. Thank you for your service on both of those things, Frank. Frank has written widely on questions concerning democratization, international political economy, nationalism, U.S. foreign policy, identity. I could go on and on trust. But his most recent book is called Identity, The Demand for Dignity and the Politics of Resentment, explaining how identifying with certain groups has changed politics in America and throughout the world. Frank, thanks for joining the podcast again. Well, thanks for having me back. So the original hook was when I think I saw you poking out of the window in Berlin for ceremonies celebrating the 30-year anniversary of the fall of Berlin Wall. And I can't even remember now, you were addressing a group, but you had this shot. Oh, I think it was our advisory council. And it made me think about back then, your famous article and then book on the end of history, and where you see us, 30 years later. And when I say us, I mean the kind of liberal democratic world. What's changed? What's been surprising? What's your kind of current level set as to where we are 30 years later? Well, you know, there's an obvious change in world politics. In 1989, we were about halfway through what Samuel Huntington labeled the third wave of democratization. Right. So this had started in Southern Europe, Latin America in the 1970s and 80s, and then it kind of hit a peak with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Countries of Eastern Europe stopped being communist dictatorships and they entered the European Union and NATO and became liberal democracies, or we thought they became liberal right. democracies. Right. Obviously, today we're living in a rather different and more difficult world. Larry Diamond has labeled this a democratic recession. You have powerful authoritarian countries, China and Russia, that are now asserting themselves. And then you have the growth of populism in a lot of Western democracies, including in the United States and Britain, which were really the, the original kind of liberal champions. So obviously, this is a tough period for democracy. Now, when I made my argument about the end of history, you know, the question was a much broader historical one. Right. Was there such a thing as historical progress? Were our politics getting better? And it seemed to me incontrovertible that there was progress and that really the only viable model out there was some form of liberal democracy. And I still think that that's fundamentally true. Right. You know, you think about your friend Vladimir Putin, he still believes he has to hold elections because right. that's really the only source of legitimacy right. in, in the modern world. And, and even the Chinese think they're on a long, slow road, right? Yeah, and they, they believe that they're still doing things that are democratically approved, even if they don't hold elections. Right. So I think that the trajectory is still there, but the problem is that, you know, there's a lot of things that people are unhappy about, and particularly, I think, both culturally and economically, globalization has produced a pretty serious backlash against this open world that the United States really played a big role in creating. But, you know, the thing is that unlike the Marxists, although I believe that there's been such a thing as history with a capital H, that is to say a right. broad process of modernization, I never believed that it was some kind of a mechanical, automatic right. unfolding of structural forces that would take place despite what anyone, you know, thought or did. Right. I think individual agency is still incredibly important. And, right. you know, we will not have democracy unless people mobilize to support democracy. And I, I think the final thing to say about the 30th anniversary, which is what I said when I was in Berlin, is that I don't think the spirit of 1989 is dead around the world. Uh -huh. You have Hong Kong, you have Armenia, you have Ukraine, you have Sudan, you have Ethiopia, you have Algeria. I mean, there are many countries in which people are pushing back against authoritarian governments. And I think What's really important is that we who live in established democracies don't forget that and don't cease to support them and don't worry about the quality of democracy in our own countries. Right. What was the mood like in Berlin? Uh, uh, it was actually quite celebratory. You know, uh -huh. the Germans have been very, they've had a lot of angst over the rise of the AFD, the Alternative for Germany, right. their populist party. Populist nationalist yeah. party, right. And the fact that their consensus government seems to be weakening and that Europe, the European project, seems to be going in reverse. But it was quite remarkable in Berlin. I mean, it was such a transformative moment when the two 
halves of Germany united that everybody really wanted to celebrate, and it was actually quite delightful to be there at that moment. I'm envious. I would have liked to have been there. Apropos of, of, you know, the waves, as you said, Huntington wrote about waves, where we're at in this other one. Of course, as our colleague Larry Diamond has written, there's been a recession. In a way, one might predict that, right? After you have a wave, you, you obviously have some pullback or revolutions. You have counter-revolutionary movements using a different paradigm. You already mentioned Russia, where we had hoped they would be part of that democratic wave. That, I think, is now proven to be not true. But in between the liberal democracies and their problems in Russia is Ukraine, a place that you seem to spend a lot of time in lately, yes. and you have a lot of interest. So first, tell us why you're so interested in Ukraine, and then tell us about what you're doing there just last month, teaching a crass course for all the new parliamentarians that have just joined the parliament recently. Well, so I think that Ukraine is the frontline country in a global struggle over democracy. And part of that is their physical geography. They're sitting right on Russia's border. Right. Uh, Russia has invaded Ukraine. It's claimed a good part of its uh, territory. And the Russians are trying to do everything they can to make democracy not succeed in Ukraine. The Ukrainians, by contrast, are amazing. The reason I keep going back is that we run these training programs for young Ukrainian leaders, young meaning, you know, people in their 30s and 40s that already have established a track record for themselves, but right. are going to be the ones that will inherit a future Ukraine. And they are amazing. You know, they don't want corruption. They want to see a genuine democracy. They want to see Ukraine become a real European country rather than get sucked back into this kleptocratic Russian orbit. It does seem to me that we who live in democracies, you know, owe it to them to support them because if they fail, it's going to have repercussions way beyond Ukraine. I mean, that entire region, I think, will be demoralized and they'll think, well, there's no alternative. You can't stand up to Russia. So that's really what's motivated me to go there. And why do you think it is? I mean, they, that they continue to keep striving to break into the liberal democratic world or striving to overthrow corrupt countries. I mean, they had a breakthrough in 91 when they became independent. That was a disappointment. They had the Orange Revolution in 2004. That was a disappointment. They've now had the Maidan Revolution of Dignitary 2014. And there's been disappointment with that. At least that's what opinion polls show. And yet... They have a brand new president, 80%, I think I heard you say the other mm -hmm. day, of the parliament are I brand knew. new people. Yeah. Is there something special about the Ukrainian society that they keep trying to fight for this? And in other countries, you'd think they might uh, would have given up at this point. And kind you of, know, yeah, I mean... How do we explain that? I can't explain it. Before the Orange Revolution in 2004, I had sort of thought that Ukraine was the least likely country to actually liberalize in the way they did, but they, they've done it. And, you know, one thing I think is really important is that they've actually had a high degree of individual freedom and political freedom. Interesting. So the Ukrainian, Even throughout all those years. Throughout all those years, uh -huh. and the Ukrainian press has been very active. They've got lots of investigative journalists. You can criticize the government. Right. And I think, you know, anyone that honestly was faced with a choice of being like Putin's Russia or living in contemporary Ukraine, and I was thinking this, you know, I was walking around the Maidan on my last visit. It's a wonderful place, you know. Right. You're young Ukrainians, partly because not everybody owns a car. They actually get out and they go to <laughs> restaurants and they it, yeah. socialize. Right. And, you know, it's just a very free, open society with lots of creativity. Mm -hmm. And I think Russia could be that way, too, if their access to information about the world wasn't controlled by the government the way it is. Right. Because I just think that anyone looking at Russia and Ukraine would immediately want to prefer to live in Ukraine. Right. Because it is fundamentally a free society. A freer place. And that's an interesting comparison, of course, because the cultural imperialists, including Putin himself, by the way, has said many times that Ukraine shouldn't exist as a country. Ukrainians are not an, a different ethnic group at all. But, but by making that argument, he kind of undermines his other arguments about how Orthodox Russians shouldn't have the kinds of freedoms that the West does. I think that's a, a real challenge for him watching what happens in Ukraine. Yeah, and also I actually think that his invasion of Ukraine has stimulated Ukrainian nationalism. Right. A lot of Ukrainians actually didn't think of themselves as particularly different from the Russians until the Crimea a great was taken point. over and the Donbass occupied and all of their fellow Ukrainians killed, you know, in this prolonged low-level war, I think that made them realize that they actually do have something to lose. Right. So ironically, 
Putin is one of the authors of Ukrainian identity. identity. One last question on Ukraine generally, and then I want to get to leadership, And but they're interrelated. You travel the world a lot. You run leadership programs all over the world. Is there something unique about the moment in Ukraine, or does it look like other breakthrough countries that you travel to, or how should people think about it in a comparative term? Well, it's certainly the most promising country that's trying to transition to democracy. I mean, the election of Zelensky and then the new parliament is just a miracle. Can you imagine any country getting rid of, you know, two-thirds of its parliament and starting over with people, a lot of whom are younger than 35 years old? I mean, I would love to see that happen in our country. You know, right, right. Get rid of all the entrenched interest in Congress. So I think they've got a unique moment there where they could be pushed in one of two directions. You know, it could be extremely good. You could have a very successful reformist government and a transition to a new generation of Ukrainians, or the whole thing could collapse. It's very fragile right now. The international situation for them is not looking good. The United States had been their strongest ally, but now it turns out you've got a president that doesn't particularly like them, that seems right. to really like Russia instead. I think Germany and France are both weakening in their support for right. Ukraine's independence. And so you know, it's a, they're in a really tough spot right tough now. Tough spot. It's good you point out the international dimensions of it because yeah. the loss of support from the United States, Merkel in her waning months or years, Macron also wants a rapprochement with Russia. The, they can't do it on their own. Well, no. maybe they can do it on their own, but it'll be a lot harder to do it. Much harder. Well, that gets me to the more general question about structures versus agents, historical determinism versus individuals. And I think there is this paradox in the way that you are often portrayed. And I want to give you a chance to tell everybody what you actually think. Going back to your End of History book, there is a theory of history and a kind of progressive structural argument, perhaps. And yet, Frank, you spent a lot of time thinking about leadership, how to train people, how to make governments more effective through a effective training programs to change them. Mm -hmm. You run three different giant programs for Stanford students in the master's program, your leadership academy, and then the work you do specifically towards Ukraine. So help us understand what seem like they might be contradictions in the way that Fukuyama <laughs> thinks about the world. Yeah, and well, when, what does it mean very practically for the work you're doing both at MIP and CDDRL? Nobody actually read my actual <laughs> book, and so they don't understand that I've been making the same arguments for some time. Yes. There's one chapter in the end of history in The Last Man entitled No Democracy Without Democrats. And by that, I mean structural forces by themselves do not right. create democracies. Right. If you don't get people that actually believe in democracy as a value, it won't happen. And therefore, individual agency is you know, extremely important. Now, if you look back over the last 30 years, Americans have given a lot of bad advice to a lot of countries, including the former Soviet you know, bloc countries. Right. I think the economic advice we gave them on privatization. In the and, 90s, you yeah, mean, right? After the, the collapse. Was right. very poor advice. Right. This idea that Americans somehow know how things work and they should go to foreign countries and tell them what to do is just profoundly misguided. Uh -huh. On the other hand, I do think that one thing we do pretty well in this country is education. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the technical sides of education, you know, kind of engineering or economics that we teach, although that's extremely important. But I do think that Americans have an ability to solve problems that is very culturally rooted in this country. We know how to cooperate pretty well. Right. We don't rely on the government to take care of everything. You know, we can organize spontaneously and so forth. Right. And in my personal experience, one of the things that a lot of countries emerging out of dictatorship or communism or kleptocracy lack is this ability to for you know, just ordinary citizens to spontaneously mobilize and then organize so that they can be effective in politics. And that, I think, is what we've really focused on in our leadership programs, is not so much transmitting the technical skills, because right. lots of places do that, but really leadership skills. We keep saying that we want to produce leaders and not technocrats, because we need people that are able to actually work effectively in a real-world situation which really means dealing with the politics. You can't bring about meaningful change unless you have political power. Right. And you can't develop political power unless you know how to organize, how to build coalitions, how to negotiate, how to communicate. And so, you know, we have several programs. We've got the Draper Hills Summer Fellows Program that you helped establish. 
We have this leadership academy for development. We have now a new Ukrainian Emerging Leaders program. And in the course of thinking about how you get young professionals to accept leadership positions, it's actually formed a t template for the Masters in International Policy. Because uh -huh. we said, well, we're teaching this to all these non-Americans. Why not teach, teach it to, to Americans as American well? American graduate students. Right. And I think and this, embedded in that is is a pretty big critique of the way other public policy yeah. schools provide. Well, I, that I don't education. want to offend any. Of my, we'll, we'll keep it abstract. Yeah, but, but tell but us I, about I do your think theory. That, yeah, yeah, I do think that in the United States, in particular, public policy programs have focused on a certain set of hard skills related to quantitative analysis, and that's all fine and important. We need evidence based policy making, especially right. in the current age that we're living in. Right. But it's not enough, and I think you need a set of soft skills as well, which really have to do with this ability to actually implement the policy, right? So it's not enough just to train a student to write the good policy memo for the boss. Right. That student has to be able to go on and help the boss implement that policy. And that's where I think a lot of our policy programs have fallen down because they don't provide a grounding in the kinds of practical skills that are necessary to take the sheet of paper and actually turn it into change on the ground. And that involves analyzing stakeholders, building communications, being able to communicate your objectives, being able to persuade people. All of those, you know, are actually what politicians have done traditionally. And it's something that people that want to exercise any form of leadership, whether you're in an NGO or in the government or an international organization, you know, these are some of the skills you're going to need to be able to marshal. And so all we've done is to try to organize this in a systematic fashion and try to teach it to students using cases because I think that's the most helpful way to actually get people to think about when you, you say cases, you mean case studies, case right? Studies, Instances yeah. where this has, has yeah. happened and, and you can dig into it. And the idea is not that a case will provide you with a best practice that you have to slavishly copy. What you want to see is how other leaders in similar difficult circumstances have tried to wrestle with their particular context and come up with solutions. But your solution is going to be different because your context is going to be different. Right. So interestingly, the same set of leadership skills that you are providing to brand new Ukrainian parliamentarians are also the ones that Americans who want to go into government could learn as well. I think, you know, anybody that brings about political change needs these skills. Now, the one thing I have to say is that it also needs to be rooted in a particular set of values, right? If you're right. a Nazi right. running a concentration right. camp, you could... We don't want you to be effective. Yeah, we don't want you to be an effective <laughs> right. leader, you know, doing right. bad things. So I think that it's also important that we transmit the kinds of values that will make a better democratic world, that will deal with corruption, which is just such a pervasive problem throughout the world these days. If the fish rots at the head, the, the rest of the body isn't going to do so well either. So right. I think it's important to keep the values connected to these practical skills. And that's, I think, how you build democratic change. That's a great note to end on. Okay. Thanks, Frank, for joining us today. All right. Thank you, Mike. You've been listening to World Class from the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. If you like this episode, please review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps new listeners find the show. And be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on what's happening in the world and why.